Hi everyone, this lesson is on graph literacy. As we draw closer to your AP Biology exam date, one thing that's absolutely guaranteed is that you're going to encounter a lot of graphs on that exam. So before we find ourselves taking it, I want to make sure we all feel comfortable interpreting the most common kinds of graphs. And should you find yourself taking the exam in person, be comfortable with knowing what graph to choose if you're asked to draw a graph. So let's go through that. Let's start with this graph. Here you can see on the y-axis we have the mean percentage egg hatch, and on the x-axis we have different months, June, July, August, and September. What type of graph are you being shown? It's a bar graph, but specifically a double bar graph. I have open bars representing an untreated group and closed or shaded bars representing a treated group, and they are side by side by month. Based on this data, what can you conclude on what's going on with the mean percentage egg hatch? Well, looking just at the bars, it appears that the untreated has a higher egg hatch than the treated, but I imagine there more, there's more to the story. It'd be helpful if there is some kind of caption explaining what went on in producing this data. Typically in an AP Bio question, there is. So here's the caption associated with this data set. Percentage of mosquito eggs that hatched at sites where male mosquitoes were infected with bacteria and released are a treated group. And sites where mosquito populations were left untreated, the white bars, didn't get any exposure to that bacteria. And then it says the error bars represent confidence intervals. Interesting. So that gives me some insight into, okay, the untreated mosquitoes, no bacteria, treated had bacteria. Seems like the bacteria is having some kind of an effect. But I want to know what these error bars are and what they mean by a 95% confidence interval. You can see at each of these bars there's a bracket going above and below the average egg hatch. What could they mean? Well these are error bars and they can represent one of three different things. Oftentimes, it'll represent standard deviation. Standard deviation is just a measure of how much of your data deviates or goes above or below the mean. An error bar can also represent standard error. This is a measure of how likely that data could change if we do repeated experiments. You can see in this graph here that as I get more and more data in my experiment, that I am getting closer and closer to representing the average. Or it can represent a confidence interval. A confidence interval is just how confident you can be that your data contains the true mean. Here's another way of thinking about that. With this graphic, the U is the mean. Each line is a different data set. I can be 95% confident here that this data is going to represent the mean because 19 out of 20 of my data samples do contain the mean in the data set. The graph always has to tell you which of these three the error bars represent. So that's why I strongly encourage you when encountering a graph, particularly on FRQs, to read the caption under the graph. If there are error bars, that caption will tell you what they mean. And for all of these, standard deviation, sample error, and confidence interval, you can find formulas if you can need to be able to calculate them on the exam on your equation sheet. So let's return to this. What do our error bars represent on this graph? They represent confidence intervals, and it tells me right there in the caption. So each of these is informing me that within 95% confident, most, confidence most of the data contain the mean. Okay, cool, I know what they mean, but how do I read the bars on the graph? How do I make any relevancy between the error bars on the treated group and the untreated group? The answer here is you're looking to see if the bars overlap or if they don't. If you look at June, July, and August, you'll see that there's no overlap between the error bars. There's no point where they both overlap one another. However, in September, they do. What does this mean? Because the answer to that will determine how we interpret the data. Well, if an error bar overlaps, that means that there's no significant difference between the data sets. It's the same data for all extensive purposes. But if they don't overlap, that means there is a significant difference between the data sets. 
That means I can declare that data set A is different than data set B. Great, that means there would be a difference between my treated or untreated groups. So knowing that, let's return to this graph. What can I conclude now on the effects of the bacteria treatment with the mosquitoes? Well, now I know that in June, July, and August, there is a significant difference between groups. The treatment did have an effect. Specifically, the bacteria reduced the likelihood of that egg hatch hatching. However, in September, there was no effect. The bars overlap. So I would say that the data is the same. There was no difference between the treated and untreated groups in September. However, there were in June, July, and August. So let's look at another graph. What kind of graph are you being shown here? This is a bar graph with a trend line, a line also known as the line of best fit. I can see on the y-axis we're measuring annual forest loss across different states. The graph on the left is from Indonesia. The graph on the right is from Brazil. So what conclusion can I reach from this data? Well, looking at Indonesia, it appears that there's an increase over time in the amount of forest lost, whereas in Brazil, there's a decrease. Looking at the caption, it informs me that the figures show forest loss in Indonesia and Brazil from the year 2000 and 2012. X-axis shows year ranges beginning with 2000 and 2001, and the bars represent the amount of forest lost. Okay, I was correct in my reading of the graph, but as typical, there is more to this graph. Forest loss annual increment Correlation and p-value describe various aspects of the trend line. So we want to know, well, how confident can I be in this trend? Does this trend line actually represent trends that are occurring in the world? Or is this just the line I drew on my graph and it doesn't match reality? To answer that question, we can look at the additional data that's been provided. We have a correlation value and a p-value. So what are these values? A correlation value is just showing you if the data is cohesive together, that there is a lot of variability or difference, or if it is together, and what direction that line is moving. I think this makes more sense when you look at the image. If you look at value zero, you'll see with no correlation, the data is scattered in every direction. I can't really make any claim that there's any pattern between the data points. However, as you move to the left or the right, you can see the correlation increases and the data coalesce, it groups together. That's what we mean by having a correlation value. But this value can be represented with either a positive or a negative. If it's a positive correlation, that is an upward trend or increasing. If it's a negative correlation, it's a downward trend or decreasing. So what's a p-value then? Well, p-values confirm the likelihood that an event occurred based on statistics. Or to put another way, it's used to confirm or refute a null hypothesis when doing a chi-square test, something you're hopefully very comfortable with doing now as we progress through the year. Here's all you need to know. P-values that are 0.05 or less are statistically significant. That means I can accept my hypothesis. There's less than a 5% chance that what I observed was caused by random chance. However, if a p-value is greater than 0.5, that means my data isn't statistically significant. It could have been caused by randomness. So I would have to reject my hypothesis and accept the null. So let's return to this graph. Should I have confidence in these trend lines? Can I be confident that this data is representing an actual correlation and that it's confirmed by the p-values? Yes. If I look at my p-values, they are very, very small, 0.001 for Indonesia, 0.009 for Brazil. And my correlations match. On the left, I have a correlation of 0.83. That's a strong correlation, and it's positive going upward. Whereas for Brazil, I have a strong correlation, 0.71. Remember, zero is scattered everywhere. One is tightly together and associated in a line. And since my correlation is negative, I can see the downward trend. Let's do something a little different this time. Imagine you're presented this data set. This is showing satellite observations of nighttime sea surface temperature for three different time periods. What kind of a graph would I use for this with a data point per date? I would use a line graph for this. Anytime I'm looking at change over time or a correlation between two values, I want to use a line graph. 
This is a helpful flowchart whenever in doubt on what kind of a graph I should use. Typically, the, what I remember is if you're comparing groups, you want to use a bar graph. If you're looking at change over time, you want to use a line graph. If you're looking at a correlation between multiple variables, you would use a scatter plot. Scatter plots are exceptionally rare in AP Biology. And if you're looking at parts of a whole, you want to use a pi. What kind of graph would I use for this data set? I have an individual, and I have two pieces of data for each individual, the number of gene copies and the presence of a protein in the saliva. Since I'm looking at two data points per individual, I want to see if there's a relationship between the number of genes and the saliva. So I would use a scatter plot and draw a trend line to show the overall trend in the correlation between those two data points. But I again want to emphasize to you, scatter plots are exceptionally rare in AP Biology. Nine times out of 10, you're asked to draw a bar or a line. So please do not make a scatter plot your default graph. What kind of graph should I use for this data set? Here I have a population, number of copy genes, another population, number of genes. And notice these populations are different groups. I have European American, I have Hadaza, I have Japanese. I would use a bar graph for this. Here I'm looking at one variable, the number of Amy1 gene copies for different populations. So I'm comparing groups. And most of the time, if you have that data available to you, you want to draw error bars if you're provided that information. This is the typical kind of graph you would see on an FRQ. Here's another graph, and the kind you probably haven't seen before. What could you infer from this graph? Well, if you look at the y-axis, I have the approximate percentages on dry weight mat, a basis. And on the x-axis, I have different components of a cell. This graph is actually showing you different percentages of a substance based on what they're made of, based on the section we're analyzing. So you can see I've drawn boxes on each one. I've made S1 red, S2 blue, and S3 green. If I look at the S2 slice, out of 100% of this cellular component, I can say that approximately 50% is made of cellulose, 45% is made of hemicelluloses, and 15% is ligand, ligandin. This is just showing me different percentages of a whole. I have a cell part looking at part of the secondary cell wall and what each component is made of. For this, I'd read it from the bottom up because you can see at the bottom of the graph, I have 0% going up to 100%. What kind of graph is this? This is what's called a box plot or a box and whisker plot. It looks confusing at first, but the information contained in this odd boxy drawing is actually very helpful in understanding what data is telling us about each of these fish populations. What could I infer from this graph? Well, it'd be helpful to first know how to read a box and whisker, right? So here's how you read a box plot. The top and the bottom, known as the whisker, represent the max or the largest data point and the min or the smallest data point. The box itself contains the first and third quartiles of the data set, which totals 50% of the data points. For our purposes, just think of it as 50% of the data. The whiskers show me the largest and smallest value. The box has 50% of the overall value. That line in the middle is showing us the median or the middle point of a data set. If I were to list all of the numbers from smallest to largest, that line in the middle is the point right at the middle of those points. And it makes sense to read it that way on a box and whisker because we have the max and min represented by each whisker. So let's try again. What can I infer from this graph about the canary rockfish now that I know how to read a box and whisker? Well, if I compare the different islands, if I look at Cordal Bank, you can see that not much similarity between the two. They look pretty different, but I'd want more data. I would want a p-value. I'd want some kind of numerical value to see if that difference is significant or not. Looking at Farland Islands, you can see the medians are very close, and 50% of the data set is very close, and so are the mins and maxes. Half Moon Bay is interesting. 
The mins and maxes are relatively close, so are the medians, but you can see there's so much less data in the red site, the RCA according to the key, than there is in the ref site, the blue according to the key. How confident could I be in this data set? Because a reminder, I want to be able to be aware of those p-values. I want to know if there is or is not a statistical difference between these, such as the differences in the location of the min and max values in Quartal Bank, or the amount of data available with the half moon data. For that, I want to look at the p-values. You can see here that there are three asterisks, and the caption tells me sample sizes displayed above each box plot, t-test statistical significance, bean lengths. And you can see that three dots is a p-value of 0 0.001. So I can be very confident in any data set that has those three dots. This is giving me a p-value where I can be confident that any differences I observe are significant. Here's a new data set. This is world carbon dioxide emissions by country. And you can see here for the world, there's 100% CO2 emissions. I have a hole and it's showing me the part of each hole. China is releasing around 30%, United States around 14%, European Union around 9.6. What kind of graph would best represent this data set? I would say a pie chart. Since we're representing parts of a whole, a pie chart is the best graphical representation. Why? Well, the graph itself is 100%, and we can take slices of that 100% to show each part of the whole. What type of graph is this? This is one you may have not seen before. Notice on the x-axis, we don't have solid numbers, but have data ranges. On the top graph, we're going 0 to 3, 3 to 6, 6 to 9, 9 to 12. Any graph that shows you buckets of data or data within a range represented by a bar is known as a histogram. Histogram is just a summary showing the distribution of data points that fall within various intervals. Why do this? The shape of the graph itself gives us a lot of information on trends that could be exhibited across the data set. So let's return to these graphs. If I look at the top left, I have the height distribution of unselected plants. The green, it says FPSC. That stands for selected fast plants. These are plants that grow faster than average. And then the orange is WFP or Wisconsin fast plants, a specific variety of these fast growing plants. Top graph shows distribution of unselected plants, and then the bottom shows a distribution of the progeny of the tall plants, or reproducing the tall plants from the first graph. So take a moment, what can you conclude from this data? Well, hopefully you saw, looking at the distribution of the traits that for the WFP, the Wisconsin flask plants, there's been a directional shift the plants have absolutely gotten taller. Interesting. This might be indicative of some kind of selection occurring, whether it, and in this example of the artificial, because the researcher is selecting who reproduces and who doesn't. But in the green, the selected fast plants, distribution changed slightly, but not much in terms of the average height. This is the advantage of using a histogram, as I can look at trends by bucketing my data into intervals. What values would strengthen the claims made from this graph, though? What is some more data that I would prefer to have? Well, it'd be great to have some more statistics. If I had something like sample error, p-values, error bars, that could make me more confident in any differences between the two groups that I observe. So my hope is this was a helpful introduction into graphs, some of which you have seen before, some of which you haven't. Please know that as long as you can read the graph, you know to look in the caption to understand what statistics are being used, and you have an idea of when to use a bar graph, a line graph, or a pie graph when you're asked to draw on a multiple choice or an FRQ, you're exactly where you want to be for your test. Thank you, and I hope this was helpful.